We finished the last episode with the crankshaft back in the engine block. Next up in line for installation are the pistons, but we still need to get rings on them. We'll get out all the pistons, caps, and hardware, and once it seems like we actually do still have everything, we'll start opening up the packages of new piston rings. In this case, the top rings are labeled with A1, so we'll start with those. We'll take a minute to measure ring gaps, and at least make sure that none of them are too small. For what I would say is a more proper way to do this, I would check out the Blazer 350 engine rebuild series where we measured at the top, middle, and bottom of each cylinder. Here I only measured at the top of each cylinder, which should be the largest gap measurement. In hindsight, I really should have measured towards the bottom, especially in the cylinders with a lot of taper, just to make sure the gaps weren't getting too small. This engine won't be seeing a lot of boost, and it'll stay relatively low RPM, so I don't think it's going to be a problem, but we may as well look at the numbers anyway. Based on some info and charts I was able to find online, the compression rings in this engine should have at least 0.025 inches of gap. And as it worked out, at the top of each cylinder, all of the rings measured out between 0.025 and 0.30 inches. Normally you wouldn't expect to see that much variance, but I double checked by switching some around and it isn't in the piston rings, that's just kind of how these cylinders came out. I think we'll be just fine with the rings as they are, and even at the bottoms of the smallest cylinders they should still have more than 0.020 inches of gap, which should be acceptable. So that takes care of both compression rings, and we'll set those aside for a minute making sure to keep them separated. And just to be on the safe side, we'll also open the bag of oil control rings and check a few of those. I didn't take the time to measure these super carefully, so we'll average them out to 0.05 inches, which is more than the factory maximum of 0.40. And now that those measurements are taken for posterity and I'm fully ready to ignore the ramifications of them, it's time to install these new rings onto our pistons. First up is the Wavy oil control expander ring, which can be easily spread over the top of the piston and slid into its groove. Then on either side of that go the two oil control wiper rings. These are very thin and easy to spiral onto the piston by hand. The compression rings are much thicker and harder to work with, so we will be using the ring expander to drop the second, lower compression ring into place. Most of the time, rings that are supposed to be installed in a specific orientation have a marker. In this case, the lower rings did not. They had a clear bevel on one side though, and typically that will face down in the second ring position. But it always pays to check with your specific piston ring manufacturer because different companies do things differently. The top ring goes on after that, and it does not appear to have a specific install orientation. The inside corners are rounded on both sides of the rings. We'll set the assembled number one piston aside and move on to all of the rest. We'll install a full set of rings onto each and every piston. Then, just like we did for the crankshaft bearings, we'll go through and make sure the connecting rods and caps are very clean. Once all of those have been thoroughly wiped down, we'll unpack the new set of bearings and make sure all of those are spotless as well. We'll drop one into each connecting rod, making sure to line up the tang, and slot one into each of the rod caps. Finally, all the pistons are ready to go and we can install them into the block. The first thing we'll do is rotate the crankshaft just a little bit to line up the rod journal with the cylinder, which will make it easier to align the connecting rod. Then, and this is a bit controversial, we'll go around and wash down each of the cylinders with WD-40. Some people say it's best to install pistons dry, I think a light oil is enough and makes them easier to install, and realistically it probably doesn't matter all that much. As a precaution, we'll place vacuum caps over the rod bolts to keep them from scraping anything up. We'll be using one of these adjustable piston ring compressors, which are kind of fiddly, but we'll get the job done. We'll install it over the piston so that it's covering and compressing all of the rings and crank down with the key. Then we'll align our number one piston with the number one cylinder bore and slide it in. We'll be reinstalling the pistons into the cylinders they came out of in the same orientation. To get it the rest of the way, we'll hold up the ring compressor and give it a solid tap with the handle of a hammer. I said a solid tap. 
There we go. Now that it's in the block and just below flush, we'll line up the rod with the crankshaft and tap the piston the rest of the way down. And once it's all the way down and fully up against the crankshaft journal, we can remove the rod bolt protectors. Just like with the crankshaft, we're going to be checking the bearing clearance, which is why we haven't applied any assembly lube. We'll put a red plastic gauge strip onto the matching cap and install it onto the rod, making sure the orientation is the same as how it came apart. A few light taps will get that fully seated and we can reinstall the rod nuts. Since these are pretty important fasteners, I like to check which is the shiny side and install that towards the rod. We'll also apply a bit of engine oil to that inner face of the nut and the rod bolt threads. Then we can snug those down and torque them each to 48 foot-pounds. We'll go back and forth and tighten them in several steps to make sure that the cap is pulled down evenly. Once final torque is reached, we'll loosen them back up and remove the cap. It was pretty on there again, so it took a few firm taps to each of the rod bolts to loosen it up. Then the cap can be removed and we'll see what's left of the wax strip. Unfortunately, this shot is a little overexposed and out of focus, so you'll kind of just have to take my word for this one. The spec for clearance is 11 to 29 thousandths, and this checks out somewhere around 15, which is right on the lower end of that. Since the crankshaft journals measured out to basically their factory sizing, this clearance makes sense. I didn't feel like checking all of the connecting rods, mostly I was just being a bit lazy, but we're going to leave it at just measuring the one. We do have to knock this number one piston back off the crankshaft to apply some assembly lube to the bearing, but once that's done and we tap it back down, we can reinstall the connecting rod cap for good. This time we'll just get the nuts snugged down and we'll go through and torque them all at the end. For now, we'll work on getting the other seven pistons into the block. We'll apply some assembly lube to the bearings while they're on the bench, then we'll get the ring compressor in place, the piston dropped into the cylinder, and we'll tap the piston in. Then it'll get pushed all the way down onto the crankshaft, and we'll install and lightly tighten down the cap. And with number two in place, we'll take care of three, and four as well. Now that we have a few pistons installed, the crankshaft isn't so easy to turn, and we're going to need a bit of assistance to rotate it to install the rest. To do that, we'll thread in a half inch 20 crank bolt with a few nuts and washers on the end to keep it from bottoming out. We'll tighten that down into the crankshaft snout and then use it to turn the engine over. That'll make it easy to line up the crankshaft journals for the next few pistons. Now we can install five, six, seven, and finally eight. With all of them installed, we can flip the engine over to torque down all of the rod caps. To help make sure we get all of them, we'll start at the front and work our way back. Just like before, we'll tighten them down in even increments all the way up to 48 foot-pounds. Just for funsies, we'll go through in reverse order and get them all again. Because of how critical these fasteners are, I wanted to make sure they were all fully tightened. They're all looking good, and the entire rotating assembly is turning as it should. There is a lot of turning friction now, but they're brand new cast iron rings and pretty roughly finished cylinders, so it seems like about how it should feel. We'll also use a feeler gauge to measure the connecting rod side play for each set and make sure everything checks out. They all measured out between 19 and 20 thousandths, which is perfectly in the middle of the spec, so those look great. At this point, we'll go ahead and remove that crank turning bolt so that we can install the chain drive sprocket from our new timing set. With a little oil on the snout of the crankshaft, we'll slide that in place. And there are more graceful ways to install this, but a piece from the ball joint press kit and a mallet did the job. Generally, if avoidable, you shouldn't be hammering on the crankshaft, but it didn't take a lot of force to install this, so I figured it wouldn't be an issue. Next, we'll go ahead and flip the engine over, facing the number one cylinder directly upwards. This next step is entirely optional, but it's something that I wanted to do to accurately calculate compression ratio. 
The numbers I had been able to find for these engines were kind of all over the place, so I figured while it was a part, we could take the measurements we need so that we could calculate it ourselves. Here we'll be measuring the piston to deck clearance. We'll clamp the style indicator to the block and set it up against the upper edge of the piston in the number one cylinder. We'll reinstall the crankshaft turning bolt and turn it over until that number one piston is on its way up. What we're looking for is the true top dead center of its travel. Basically, we'll turn the crankshaft back and forth just a little bit at a time until we get the highest possible reading on this indicator. That means the piston is at the absolute height of its travel. Then all we have to do is use a feeler gauge between the top of the piston and the deck surface. I'm glad we measured that so now we know the actual deck clearance and can more accurately calculate a compression ratio. That number was the last unknown as I was able to confidently find specs for all of the other parts. Doing the math, the compression ratio for this engine should come out right about 7.75 to 1. I'm happy with that number and I think it'll work out nicely for our low-end supercharger setup. And now that we've sorted that out, we'll level the engine again and get ready to install the camshaft. This is the new one I ended up choosing for this engine. It's a Summit 1300, specifically a K1300 because it comes with a new set of flat tappet hydraulic lifters. It's a mild cam that should play nice with forced induction and keeps the overall valve lift under 500, which is about the limit for the factory rocker and spring setup. Hopefully it does what I want it to, and the only way to find out is to install it. This kit came with a packet of molly lube for the camshaft lobes, which is what we'll be using. But before applying any of that, I figured it would be a good idea to remove the factory oil coating and anything else that may have made its way onto the cam. We'll give it a thorough spray down with brake clean and wipe down each and every lobe and bearing surface. Once that's done, we'll bring it back inside and thread in two long bolts to make the camshaft easier to handle. In an attempt to make less of a mess while handling it, I decided to lube half the camshaft now and half while it's being installed into the block. The impact gun is serving as a counterweight to hold the cam in place while we hang it over the edge of the table. All of the lifter lobes will get a thorough coating of this molly grease which will help greatly during camshaft break-in. We won't be stingy about it and we'll make sure every single lobe is coated all the way around. We'll also apply molly lube to the distributor drive gear. The cam bearing journals will just get a coat of that tacky engine assembly lube. The first half of the camshaft looks nice and sticky, so we're ready to start installing it. We'll really take our time here and do as much as we can to keep from dragging anything across the cam bearing surfaces. Once the first two journals are securely inside the engine block, we'll go ahead and lube more of the cam. We'll give the next journal and four lobes the same treatment we gave the rest of them and slide it in one bearing farther. Then we'll lube the number two journal and get that into place as well. This last one is going to be the hardest and is bound to make some kind of a mess no matter what I do, so we'll go ahead and apply some molly lube to the cam lobes and assembly lube to the cam journal. That last lobe towards the front is for the mechanical fuel pump, which this block doesn't have, so we don't need to worry about that. Using those bolts for leverage, I'll lift up as hard as I'm able to and push the cam towards the back of the block. Finally, it all slots into place and the camshaft is fully installed. Now we can unthread those two long bolts and get ready to install the camshaft sprocket from the new timing set. We'll drop that onto the dowel in the camshaft and thread in one bolt to hold it in place. And we'll rotate the crankshaft until the dot on its sprocket is facing upwards towards the camshaft. With those two matched up, we can remove the bolt and the sprocket, just to reinstall the sprocket with the timing chain draped over it. We'll get the chain into place on the crankshaft sprocket and then reinstall the camshaft one. We'll apply blue thread locker to each of the camshaft bolts and thread them in, and we'll torque each of those down to 20 foot-pounds. With that fully installed, we'll give the crankshaft two full rotations and make sure those timing marks line back up. Everything here looks good, so we'll keep moving along. Next in line for installation are the cylinder heads, so we'll start getting all the parts together to make that happen. We'll unpack all of the parts that we cleaned, including the push rods, rockers, rocker hardware, and a whole bunch of bolts. <laughs> 
With all that hardware laying out and itching to be installed, let's start by prepping the block deck surface. Starting with the driver's side, we'll spray it down with brake clean and use a shop towel to wipe it down. And after that, we'll use the blowgun attached to the air compressor at a relatively low PSI and blow off anything left on the surface. Some of the sharp edges like to shred paper towels, so this is a good extra step to make sure there's no debris left from them. Then we'll go ahead and unwrap one of the new head gaskets. These are pretty standard gaskets, and they install with the Printo Seal type embossing towards the block. The gasket fits snugly over the dowel pins, which will hold it in place while we install the cylinder head, which we will go ahead and unwrap. Well, in the videos where we rebuilt these, some of the comments were pretty concerned about the intake valve I chose to reuse. So I caved and found some money in the budget to buy a shiny new valve that will replace the old ugly one. Of course, we'll have to take some things apart and lap this into the cylinder head, so let's go grab it- oh shit! <sighs> well, that's yet another engine part lost in a tragic boating accident. I really gotta stop bringing those on fishing trips. Eh, I guess we'd better go crawling on back to that cylinder head with its pitted nasty valve because at least it's not sitting at the bottom of a body of water. We'll get that gasket surface cleaned up just like we did for the engine block using brake clean, shop towels, and the air compressor. Then, being careful not to let the bottom surface touch anything, we'll heft it over to the engine block and drop it onto the dowel pins. And we'll thread in just one bolt to make sure it stays there. Before installing any bolts for good, we'll oil under each head and apply some thread sealer. On this block, every single one of these bolts goes through to the water jacket, so they all need sealer. Of course, we'll also pull back out the one we threaded in for security and put sealer on that too. And once all 16 of those are in place, we'll start snugging them down. And once that's done, we'll break out the torque wrench and start clicking. We'll be tightening these bolts in sequence in three steps. The first of which will be 30 foot-pounds. There is a particular pattern that you can see me following, but generally you're starting in the center and working your way out as usual. Once we've gone all the way through and gotten them to 30 foot-pounds, the next step will be 60. And once we've worked our way through the pattern again, we'll do one more pass at the final torque value of 80 foot-pounds. And 16 clicks later, the driver's side head is fully tightened down. So it's time to get excited because we get to do all of that again on the passenger side. We'll spray, wipe, and blow off the deck surface, drop on a new head gasket, unwrap, spray, wipe, and blow off the cylinder head, and try not to throw my back out while plonking the head down onto the engine block. All of the bolts get oiled, sealed, and dropped into place, and then snug down. And now that it's torquing time, we'll again start with a first pass of 30 foot-pounds, go through a second pass at 60, and finally a third pass at 80 foot-pounds. And with that, finally all of the bolts are tight and both cylinder heads are installed. Now we get to finish putting together the valve train. We'll start by opening up and examining all of our new lifters. Just like the bearings, they all appear very clean, but in order to not take any chances, we'll give them each a wipe down before installing them. Then each lifter body will get a coating of assembly lube on the sides and a dab of molly grease on the face. And with that thoroughly gooped up, we can drop it into its bore. There's no order to follow here since they're all new parts. Then we'll go through and install the other seven pairs of lifters. They all seem like a perfect fit and every single one dropped in easily. Once they're all in place, we'll go around and put assembly lube on the pushrod cups of each of them. Then it's time for the pushrods. I didn't keep the pushrods matched up with the rockers, but we will maintain their vertical orientation. Each one is visibly scuffed on one side from passing through its pushrod guide plate. So we'll keep that end facing up and we'll make sure the short and long pushrods end up in the right places. The exhaust valves get long pushrods while the intake valves get short ones. 
We'll fill out the driver's side by dropping each push rod into its respective lifter, and then do the same for the eight push rods on the passenger side. And we'll go through and put assembly lube on the tip of each push rod, as well as on the tip of each valve stem. This will help ensure that the entire valve train stays lubricated during break-in and any test firings. Next, we can start putting back together the rocker arm assemblies, starting with a pushrod guide plate. Then we'll apply assembly lube to the contact points on the arms, align them with their pushrods and valves, and thread in the bolts. Then we'll get each of those snugged down. And we're going to pause here for just a moment to address that net lash rocker assembly that we're keeping. This is the factory type setup on Gen 5 and 6 big blocks, where the preload on the lifters is preset and non-adjustable. I wasn't able to find any super definitive information, but it seems like the general consensus is that this valve train setup is good for up to 500 thousandths at the valve. But even the customer service reps for the camshaft brand are a little fuzzy on that. On the product page for the C1300, which is just the cam itself, a rep said it is compatible with the stock valve train. But on a product page for the K1300, which is the cam and lifter set, a rep said it is not compatible with non-adjustable rockers. The best evidence I have that everything should play nicely together comes from GM themselves. The 96 to 2000 engines had more lobe lift, in fact pretty similar amounts to this aftermarket camshaft. So I'm pretty sure we'll be fine with it as is, but if it seems like something isn't jiving quite right, we can switch over to this adjustable stud system. For now, we'll be retaining the net lash setup, and we have all of the rockers in place. We'll go through and torque all of those to 40 foot-pounds. It would definitely be more ideal to torque these while they're on the base circle of the cam, since the valve spring tension could prevent the bolt from getting to full torque. So it's certainly not the best practice and not what I would recommend, but with these low strength valve springs it probably doesn't make a lot of difference. And after doing that the wrong way, for every one of them, we'll turn the engine over a few times and make sure everything is moving. Between the pistons and the complete valve train, it takes a fair amount of force to turn things over now, but it appears that everything is working the way it should. We'll also take this time to oil the timing chain, since we hadn't up until now. Just to be extra thorough, we'll put some assembly lube on the sprocket teeth as well as the chain. Then we'll turn it over a bit and pour just regular engine oil over the chain. That should be plenty to keep everything oiled as the engine starts up. And with that taken care of, it's time to get back out the timing cover. This is the one we modified a bit and sandblasted. It didn't get a coat of paint since I had planned to paint the engine once assembled, and I was hoping it would be okay sitting around as plain steel since it would make the paint prep later easier, but obviously that wasn't the case. Since sandblasting and washing it, there are a few very light spots of rust that have formed. We'll grab the red scotch bright, and it only takes a few seconds of scrubbing to knock the rust down. And after spraying and wiping down the cover to make sure there's no residue left from the scotch bright, it's time to install the front seal. This is the new seal included with the engine rebuild kit, and just for a tiny bit of extra security, we'll apply some blue Loctite to the outer diameter. Then we'll drop it into place on the timing cover, and using this piece from the ball joint press kit, knock it into place. We'll make sure to hammer evenly around the seal so that it goes into the cover straight. With that sitting in there nicely, we'll clean up the excess Loctite and the cover is ready to be reinstalled. We'll make sure the block is clean where the bottom of the timing cover meets it so that we can add a little bit of RTV to seal that gap. We'll be applying a bit more to the corners when installing the oil pan gasket, but applying some now that'll get clamped under the cover is good for a little extra security. Then we'll take the paper gasket and spray it down with WD-40, which makes it a little bit less likely to stick. We'll slot that into the dowels on the block to hold it still, and carefully slide the cover over the crankshaft. We'll get the first bolt started to hold it in place, and then work our way around to install the other nine. Those will all get snugged down in a crisscross pattern, then we'll work our way around and tighten each of the bolts to 96 inch pounds. And with that, the cover is fully installed. We were able to get a lot done in this episode, and we're coming out of it with a complete long block. 
but we're still not done, and the next episode will be covering even more of the reassembly. 